Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to look at different types of chemical reactions and how we can go about classifying them. So we're going to look at three main types of chemical reactions here and what we can learn about them. So let's go ahead and start off by looking at those reactions themselves. And what we're going to look at are precipitation reactions, acid base reactions and oxidation reduction reactions. In a precipitation reaction, we will have that the substances that are dissolved in water will react together to form solids that will then precipitate out. So it is the solid that will then come out of the solution and form a compound there. In an acid base reaction, we will take a hydrogen ion that will be transferred from one chemical species to another. And finally, in an oxidation reduction reaction, we will look at transfer of electrons between various atoms and molecules. So let's go ahead and look at our first of these here. And that would be a precipitation reaction. And we want to look at a couple of definitions. First of all, what is the solubility of a substance? And that is how much material can be dissolved in the water, for example example. So the maximum concentration of a substance that can be achieved, how much of that substance can be dissolved within water. And a soluble substance is one with a high solubility. So high solubility, you have something you can get a lot of dissolved in water. And an insoluble substance would have a low solubility, you're not going to be able to put a whole lot of it, it's going to have a much lower concentration. And then we have the precipitate. That occurs when the concentration exceeds the solubility. So you've gotten too much, you've exceeded this maximum, and then something will precipitate out. You can no longer have it in solution, and it will precipitate out. Now we can look at this in part in the table in our textbook, and the table gives us some solubility. So this is a good one to refer to when looking at solubility uh, reactions. And soluble compounds are going to be much less likely to give a precipitate than an insoluble compound. So soluble compounds contain these ions in general right here in this section. So if you're looking at those ions, likely they are going to be soluble with certain exceptions. Here we have no exceptions. Here we have no exceptions. But with these compounds and with fluorine here and with SO4, with they, when they combine with certain atoms or ions, then they will become insoluble. So you have to always look at these exceptions. Don't just look at the ions here. You have to double check if you're in some of these, you may end up with some of these that have exceptions. These tend to be insoluble. So these are ones that are likely to precipitate out unless of course they meet the exceptions here. So watch the exceptions there as well. So let's go ahead and look at our example here, which is a mixture of potassium iodide and lead nitrate. When we mix those two together, and here we have the balanced equation that you would need, they combine together and they separate out into ions and then they recombine into new compounds. So the potassium was bound with the iodine here, but now it is lead and iodine that are combined. And here it was lead and nitrate and now the potassium is there with the nitrate. Now what we want to look at is which of these is going to precipitate and this is where we need to go back to and look at our equation. So which of these we have an iodine ion and we have lead ions as well as the nitrate ions and the uh, potassium ions. So we can go back and look at this for, for example, for lead and iodine. And let's take a look and see what it tells us. Well, if we look up the iodine atom, and we find that right here, we find that it's generally soluble. But if it's combined with lead right here, then it is not. So that would tell us this is one of the exceptions and the lead and iodine are going to combine together to precipitate out. And that's what we see in the reaction. Now we often can write this as just an ionic equation looking only at the things that are actually reacting which are the lead, the iodine, and forming the lead iodide. And that's what we see precipitating out in 
the solution here. Now we can go ahead and look through a few more examples of these. And what we want to look at first of all is mixing silver nitrate and sodium fluoride. Well, the first thing we look at are what are the ions that are going to be formed, we're going to separate out the silver and the nitrate, and we're going to separate out the sodium and the fluorine. So we separate those out. That's the first thing we get. And we get that these are the ions that are formed. And what are the compounds then that can form from what we already had? Well, the other compounds that could form are switching these up. We had Ag silver with NO3, but we could have the sodium combining with NO3, and we could have the silver combining with the fluoride. So that would be the other choice from what we had when we mixed the two originally. So once they dissolve into ions, the two things that can form are uh, NaNO3 and AgF. So which one of these would be the precipitate? Well, we have to go back to look at our solubility guide guidelines. And we find that fluorine is generally soluble unless it combines with silver. So if we go back to our solubility guidelines here, then we find that fluoride fluorine ions are generally insoluble, but combining them with silver does make it insoluble. So that's what's going to come out of the equation. And if we looked, our other one was NO3, and NO3 was soluble with no exceptions. So we know what is going to precipitate out because we can look at our precipitate at our solubility guidelines here to find out what that's going to be. And we'd find then that the equation would be that sodium fluoride in an aqueous solution plus the silver nitrate yields the silver fluoride and sodium nitrate and the silver fluoride is the one that is going to precipitate out as a solid and the NaNO3 will remain in an aqueous solution. So we can write that again. Sometimes you might write it as the ionic equation. And we're only looking at what's reacting there. And that is the silver positive ion. And the fluorine negative ion gives us the silver fluoride in a precipitate or, or a solid. So let's go ahead and look at two more examples here. And we're going to look at potassium sulfate and barium nitrate. So when we combine those two in water, then remember they'll split up into ions and we will get the potassium uh, combining now with the nitrate and the barium with the sulfate. So we will have those switched and we have to figure out which of these is going to be insoluble. Well go back to your insolubility guidelines and check, check those and what you'll find is that BASO4 is what is insoluble and therefore you can write the net ionic equation as Ba with a positive two charge plus SO4 with a negative two charge yields BaSO4, the first two in an aqueous solution dissolved in water, and the second one is a solid precipitate. So when you connect, when you combine those two. Now our next example was to look at lithium chloride and silver acetate. So lithium chloride and silver acetate, remember we're going to switch. So now lithium will combine with the acetate, silver, and the silver will combine with the chlorine. And what we'll get is we've got to look up which of the, again, which of these two is going to be insoluble. And again, go back to your guidelines and you will find that it is the silver chloride that is insoluble. And therefore, we can write our net ionic equation. We're looking at just what precipitates as silver with a positive one charge plus chlorine with a negative one charge yields the silver chloride as a solid. Now, the second type of reactions we wanted to look at are acid base reactions. These occur when a hydrogen ion is transferred. So an acid will be a substance that will give hydronium ions, which are H3O, when dissolved in water. So the example here is looking at hydro hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid, HCl. And you add that with, with water in an aqueous solution. And that will give you 
ion. So it'll give you a chlorine ion, but the hydrogen ion combines with the water to then give you the hydronium ion H3O plus and the chlorine remains in an aqueous solution. So here we have it pictured. We have the water molecules. When you add the HCl and they get mixed, then the chlorine is left there and there's some water, but some of the some of it has turned into H3O as the uh, hydrogen atoms are transferred. Now we can either have a strong acid where all of it dissociates or a weak acid in which only some of the compound will dissociate. Now for a base, when we look at a base, again, a hydrogen ion is transferred. The base will yield hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. So NaOH becomes Na plus an OH molecule. So again, what we're taking is we are still transferring a hydrogen. If we look at the overall equation here, uh, for example, if we take ammonia and water, we will end up with one of the hydrogens being transferred to the ammonia, the NH3, giving you NH4 plus. And leaving from the water will just have an OH and that will become OH with a negative charge. So again, we are transferring that hydrogen atom from the water in this case to the uh, other material and leaving us with the hydroxide or OH negative ion. The other one we can have, we've looked at acid and base, we can also have a neutralization at reaction where an acid and a base are combined together and they give you a salt uh, not necessarily sodium chloride which is a salt is table salt but there are many other salts as well plus water so the example here if we mix uh, uh, a magnesium uh, hydroxide with the hydrochloric acid so we have a base here this is the base this is the acid and then this becomes the salt MgCl2 magnesium chloride is the salt and then water. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the OH from here and combining it with the hydrogen from here. Those two combine together to give us water. So the H and the OH combine to give water. What's left over the magnesium and the chlorine will combine together to give us the salt. So the other material, once you take the water out, is what go is going to be the salt. And if you did this with sodium and hydrochlor and HCl, uh, you could get the same thing and you would get table salt out of it by mixing the acid and the base together. So let's go ahead and look at a couple examples here. And we want to write the acid base reactions described. First, we're going to look at a weak acid where hypochlorite reacts with water. So HOCl plus H2O. And what are we going to get if we combine those two together? And what we find, remember what we're doing when we're looking at an acid, that because this is a weak acid, we are going to be transferring an, a hydrogen from this into the water to give us H3O plus. So that will give us our hydronium ion. And what's left over? Well, we know where all of this went. All that's left once we take the hydrogen out of here is the OCl negative. And that's what we will get uh, left over. So that would be our reaction. Again, we're just taking, if it's an acid reaction, we're taking the hydrogen off, adding it to the water. And that is going to give us the hydronium. And what's left over is what we will see in the aqueous solution. Now, we can look at our other example, in which case we are looking at a neutralization reaction. We're going to look at barium hydroxide. There's our base. And we're going to look at nitric acid, which is our acid. So again, remember, it's a neutralization reaction. We are going to combine the OH and the H. Those are going to combine to give us water. So that's going to give us H2O. And then we're going to look at what's left over. So what's left over in this case would be, we can write our equation here, 
And when we combine those together and again make sure we're balancing it is that there's the water that comes out. But what's left over is barium here and the nitrate here. So you're going to get barium nitrate as the salt in the aqueous solution. So again, once you pull out the OH and the H, what's left over, and then you'll have to relook at it to make sure it's balanced. Just remember, because the balancing may not be automatic here, you may have to rework that a little bit, as we've looked at previously. Now, the last type of reaction that we wanted to look at was the oxidation reduction reaction. In this case, we can look at oxidation as a loss of electrons and reduction as a gain of electrons. So the reducing agent is what is oxidized, meaning it loses electrons. The oxidizing agent is the species that is reduced, meaning it gains electrons. So reducing agent will lose electrons. It is what is oxidized and the oxidizing agent will gain electrons. So we could look at some examples uh, here and look a little more of this. Um, the oxidation numbers is what we want to be able to figure out. So the oxidation number or oxidation state, the oxidation number of an atom would be zero. So if it is a neutral atom, it would have an oxidation of zero. If it's a monatomic ion, it's equal to the charge of the ion. So if it has a negative two charge, then the oxidation number is negative two. If it has a positive two charge, then the oxidation would be positive two. Some oxidations for common other materials would be hydrogen has plus one if you combine it with a nonmetal or minus one when combined with metal. So depending on whether it gained or lost an electron. Oxygen is generally negative two and the halogens are generally negative one. And in fact, for fluorine, that's always the case and almost always for the other ones. When we look at molecules, we can look at the sum of the oxidation numbers of in a molecule is equal to the charge on that molecule. So if we're looking at a specific molecule with a charge on it, the sum of the oxidation numbers is going to end up being equal to the charge. Now let's go ahead and look at some examples of these. And first of all, let's figure out the oxidation numbers of H2S and SO3 with a two negative charge. So we'll look at these two. First of all, we look at H2S. Remember, H has an oxidation of plus one in this case. So we know what that is. The charge, because we're not listed as a charge because there's nothing up here, then it has no charge. So the charge is zero. And the two hydrogens will have an oxidation of plus two. Remember, each of them has a plus one. So two of them will have a plus two. So what we know is that the molecule must have a zero. We know that hydrogen has plus two. We can figure that one out. So what is sulfur? What is the oxidation of sulfur? Well, zero is equal to positive two plus something. Well, the only thing that you can add to positive two to get zero is negative two. So the oxidation of sulfur must be negative two. Let's look at one more example of these. And that would be looking at SO3 with a two negative charge. So we know that oxygen has an oxidation number of negative two. We also know that the charge is negative two. So we can set up our little equation here to say that negative two, that's the total charge on that molecule, is equal to negative two, that's the oxidation number of oxygen, times three, that's three oxygen atoms that are present here, yields plus something. So negative two has to equal negative two times three plus something. And we can work this out. So negative two equals negative six plus what? What number do we add to negative six to get negative two? And that would be four. So negative four plus six, uh, negative, uh, sorry, negative six plus four gives us negative two. And therefore the oxidation of sulfur must be positive four. So we know that the oxidation of uh, the oxygen is negative two and the sulfur is positive four. Now let's go ahead and finish up this with our summary. And what we looked at were three types of reactions. We looked at precipitation, 
acid base and oxidation reduction. We looked at the solubility of a substance which tells us how much of it can remain dissolved. And we looked at acid bases. Acids give hydronium ions. Bases give hydroxide ions. So OH negative for hydroxide. And hydronium was H3O plus. And that will give us either an acid in this case or a base in the other case. And we looked at oxidation as a loss of electrons and reduction is as a gaining of electrons. And we looked at calculating those different oxidation states. So that concludes this lecture on classifying chemical reactions. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.